Today we're here in Queenscliff and we're going through the basics of masonry design as there's some amazing masonry structures here in Queenscliff that allow you to understand both historical masonry and traditional masonry and it'll give you some great examples on what you need to consider in your designs in any masonry structure. And Queenscliff has this fort that has this amazing brick external facade to it that allows you to understand some of the basics that you need to carefully consider. So as we can see, most structures are built in layers and courses. And the way you lay the bricks will be dependent on what type of structure you're building. And we can see here at this wall that we've got a number of different courses. So we've got our typical stretcher block that you'll see in most modern builds today, and even in historical builds, where you've got your one block here, but typically you'll see another block here overlaying on the joint. So they're keying in. But in this building, we can see that we've got our stretcher block, and then we've got a header course. What a header course does, it goes into the brick wall, tying one or multiple layers together, creating a stiffer structure, especially in fences. So we can see we've got our stretcher course, header course, stretcher course, and header course. Another key element we can see here is we've got brick piers. So brick piers are typically in walls, sometimes if you need to stiffen them up for height, but most commonly done in fences as it's done here. So the pier is actually bigger. So if we walk across, we can see we've got our traditional fence in between that's thinner and then we go across to another pier that's essentially bigger so what it allows you to do is create a stiffer structure sometimes you can also reinforce the centers of them so you'll have your pier which will be the main spanning element for the height and you'll have typical wall in between it they'll span between the piers bricks are also made up of two different types so you either have articulated masonry or non-articulated masonry so articulated masonry is the typical one that you see or have joints at certain centers. There's two reasons potentially why you articulate your masonry versus not. One of the biggest ones is your footing designs. As we can see here on this fort, this is a non-articulated masonry structure. So we've got this big footing system here, which is made out of bluestone. The reason why they're made out of bluestone is because of the weight, it's heavy, so it won't move very much. They're also bigger, so it helps you span across it. Also when talking about footings, it's highly dependent on the materials underneath. As we've known from footing designs, soils can be different levels of reactivity. So in a highly reactive soil, you're more likely to go for your articulated masonry as there will be a lot of movement as you'll need a stiffer footing system. Where if you're sitting on rock or sand, you may be more beneficial to go for your non-articulated masonry as you do not need that stiffer footing design. I'd just like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is a place where you can invest your time to unwind and relax through the premium content that is ad free, where you can have a variety of courses that you can take to help improve your career. As I've said in earlier videos, your really key assets are improving your communication skills, either that technical professional writing or speaking, and they have a variety of courses through Skillshare that allow you to improve those. There's also a number of courses on engineering and one specifically on ETABS design. So if you're interested in learning about ETABS, there's a course specifically made in there as well for you. I also have a link in my below description where the first 1,000 subscribers will get one month free through Skillshare. So in traditional designs, if you're doing a non-articulated design, your footing system needs to be a lot heavier because it can't allow for that movement. This will also determine if you've got lintels or headers. You'll need to make sure the lintels are stiffer as a non-articulated masonry structure only has a limited amount of deflection tolerance that it allows for. Now, the reasons why you choose one over the other, the first one is that footing system. The second one is temperature. As a brick wall will expand like any material over a temperature. So we've got a wall that's about 30 meters long with a differential temperature of around 40 degrees that wall will expand up to 13 millimeters, which is quite a lot of movement that the brick wall needs to accommodate. So if you've got a really long wall, you will need to make sure you've got articulation joints or allow for some movement as the wall will potentially crack under those expansions. But in our modern articulated masonry, we can see that we've got a lot more articulation joints. As the footings are moving and the lintels are moving, you need to make sure you're locating your articulation joints in the right locations. At this building here, we can see the perfect example between articulated masonry and non-articulated masonry. At the start of the town hall, we've got articulated masonry. We can see this through the beautiful location of these joints above these openings. But if you walk back towards this way, we can see the original building, which is a non-articulated masonry with beautiful arches. And we can see through maintaining perfect footings 
and good detailing, they haven't seen much cracking in the facade of this structure. Typically, you'll need to locate them over either an opening, either on one side or both, depending on how long the opening is. You also need to locate them roughly at about six meter centers, as you need to make sure you're making those grids roughly square, similar to what you would do in concrete. And also corners are really stiff. So you need to make sure you've got your first articulation joint within about four meters of any corner. And a couple of key things when you're doing articulated masonry design is locating those articulation joints because they will either be determined whether your structure is going to crack or not. Masonry structures also need to accommodate for lentils and headers. So if we look up here, we've got a couple of arches in here, which they're really utilizing the benefits of brickwork. See brickwork much like concrete is only really good under compression forces. And the arches that we can see here really emphasize the benefits of this. As the arch, we've got here at the lower level, which is the pointed arch, and at the higher level, we've got a flat arch, and they're both working in the same way. So the pointed arch, it's quite easy to see how that's working. As all the bricks are pitched on a certain level, it's forcing the load down the arches and compressing that location. So any of the flexural forces or tension forces that would be typically in the bottom of that lintel are overcome by the gravity force. But the flat arch also acts in the same way. As we can see, the bricks are pitched. So as the gravity comes down, it's creating a thrust force at the bottom. So you just need to make sure that you've got enough gravity down to overcome any tension forces in the bottom of that arch. So we can see another form of an arch structure here. And we can see with our row arch here, where it's got a number of different courses and they're essentially built in rows up to the central point, which is the keystone. So to build this, they would potentially have temporary supports underneath here, building up the rows of brickwork over the top and lastly putting in the keystone that will lock everything into place. When we look at the structure here, we can see quite a beautiful example of a traditional method of masonry structures. And we can see it's quite beautiful with all its arches acting in the way that masonry wants to act. We're looking over the windows with the keystones or between the pillars. We can see if it's built and detailed correctly, it can lead to quite a beautiful design. There's also a number of ways of how masonry structures can be built. Sometimes you can have it as a masonry vineyard, which is more our typical build where you've got the masonry on the outside. It's only really acting as a cladding to the building. And then you'll either have steel or timber on the inside to form up the main load bearing element. Or if we look at this fort, these walls are definitely load bearing. So this is a load bearing masonry design where you need to be a little bit more careful with your design as it will be taking vertical loads. Any good masonry design needs to consider the dimensions of any brick as if we need to cut bricks, it's really wasteful to design. So if we look at our traditional brickwork that we can see here, we can really determine the dimensions of the bricks. So we've got a 230 long brick across here. It's 90 high and it's one tech 10 thick. So we can see that from our brick here, the dimensions of the brick. Now if we move along, we can see that because of this building moving in, it didn't quite line up. So they had to cut several bricks to be able to lay out this brickwork. So this means there's a lot more work to cut the bricks, where if you had made it slightly smaller, they may not need to have done this, making it a more efficient design. Now, when you're designing masonry, there's also different dimensions of brickwork. So if you're doing concrete bricks, they will come with different dimensions. So when you're trying to lay out the length of your wall, trying to maintain in those unit lengths, the construction of a brick wall is made up of a number of different segments. So we've got our traditional bricks here. Now bricks also come in two different types. So we've got our clay bricks here, which is your more your common one, but they also come in concrete and they also have different properties. So you wanna try and make sure you're not mismatching different types of brickwork. But if we're looking here, whether we're using clay or concrete, they still have a similar feature as you've got your clay brick here and you also have your mortar. So a building is built up of different elements when you're doing your masonry design. You've got your brick, and then you, but you'll always have your mortar. So your mortar is essentially joining the bricks together to allowing for that interlock and making sure they're laying correctly. As not every brick is exactly the same, so you need to have some tolerance. Another key thing you need to worry about in masonry design is how bricks actually perform. One of the key elements is the failure of bricks is a brittle failure. So it's like a concrete structure without the reinforcement in it. And we can see that through this joint here. So it's been somewhat restrained by the corner and the piers, forcing a crack through this location. So something you need to be carefully consider when detailing your structures, making sure you're not causing any of those restraints, or if you are, putting in articulation joints. Another key thing about any masonry design, whether it's that block or that clay brick that we see here, is the fact that they're porous, so they allow water to flow through them. So on modern structures, you'll typically see a damp coarse membrane at the bottom that allow the water to flow out, 
But if you have any timber or steel up against them, you need to make sure you designed it for that external use. So you either need to galvanize it to protect it for long term or have the appropriate timber in these locations. Another key thing about any masonry design is the fact that you need to span over openings as a wall would be a typically a high wall that will span between it and you need to allow for either headers or lintels over the top into the brickwork. So you'll either have an angle or a T-section in a double brick wall where the angle will be cast into it, spanning over the opening and into the course and you won't see it as it'll be in behind or the T is essentially doing the same thing hidden inside the course of brickwork. In masonry new veneer, this will potentially be a PFC. So the PFC will be cast into the brickwork with a shelf plate on the bottom supporting the brickwork over. So if you need to span further, it may either be steel or concrete. So you may have a big steel beam that you may see exposed, or sometimes you'll see that concrete section spanning over the opening. Now, we've talked about the arches before. The arches are also doing that work, but they're doing it more efficiently. But as you can see, they make up more space. Without the support of Skillshare and my patrons, these type of episodes would not be possible. As always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week.